Hello everyone and welcome to the first lecture in our next module which is ecology and organismal interactions and so today I want to do just a brief introduction to ecology. When we look at our planet we notice that it's covered in different ecosystems and we know that um, an ecosystem uh, is different because the, uh, the temperature and the weather, the climate is different, but also the things that live there are different. The organisms that live there are well adapted to their environment, but may not be adapted to other environments. And um, we also know that when we look in our oceans, that they are teeming with life as well. And there are different environments within the oceans and within aquatic environments um, that harbor different animals. And uh, we know that even the very bottom of the ocean, where no sunlight can reach, that there is uh, there's living organisms there as well. And so um, we depend on our ecosystems. We take resources out of the ecosystems and we put our waste back into the ecosystems. And really, we have the greatest effect of anything um, on our planet and on our ecosystems. And so it makes sense that we would uh, come up with a plan of study of these ecosystems called ecology and ecology is the study of how living things interact with each other and how they interact with their environment. When we look at how life interacts with other living things we call these biotic factors and biotic means living uh, and we think about how life interacts with non-living things we call this abiotic factors or the non-living factors. And so first I want to uh, go through what the abiotic factors are. And um, abiotic factors affect the ability of organisms to survive and reproduce. The, they're called limiting factors because they restrict the growth of populations. They limit them. They help determine the types of numbers of organisms that are able to exist within an environment. So types and numbers of organisms that are able to exist within an environment. Uh, the first one I want to talk about is water. Uh, even though we're talking about abiotic factors, the definition really is water is life, right? 60% uh, of our adult body is made of water, and some organisms can get up to 95%. Uh, really, all living organisms are at least 50% water-based, so um, uh, really it is totally intricate to our, and totally we totally depend on it. Um, some organisms live in water. Um, and so they'd be dependent on it just for uh, their environment. Uh, water is essential because other substances easily dissolve into it, and that allows nutrients to be carried to and from cells and the waste that cells create to be carried away from them. So when we talk about uh, the next abiotic factor, that's soil. And we might be aware that soils are different from place to place, and uh, they're made up of slightly different sized uh, material. And this can be a big factor to which plants live in a certain area or which animals live in a certain area. So it's just another non-living factor that influences the living factors of an environment. Uh, the next is the pH scale. Uh, if you've heard anything about pH scale, you might know that it goes from 0 to 14, where 0, numbers close to 0, are acidic, uh, and numbers close to 14 are what are called basic, and somewhere right in the middle, about 7, is called neutral. Um, it's, a pH scale is used to specify how acidic or basic some sort of solution is. Um, this is a scale that inversely measures the amount of hydrogen ions. So hydrogen ions, an ion is a charged particle, um, and it's a charged particle of hydrogen, and it's inversely measuring it, so a low rating of the pH scale also just actually means that there's a, um, there are more hydrogen ions. So there's more hydrogen ions in an acidic solution than there are in a basic solution. And organisms that live in a very specific environment, like the uh, gut biota that live in your stomach acid, really only do well in acidic conditions. Whereas if you were to put that uh, gut biota in a basic solution, they would not do well. They would probably uh, d they would probably die. And vice versa, if you put some uh, organisms that like to live in a neutral or basic solution in an acidic solution they would not do well either. The next one I want to talk about is sunlight. And this actually has a lot of different components to it. So 
we know that we live in a in a place that has relatively close to four seasons. Um, that's more of just a little bit of a joke, but uh, we know that we have a summer, spring, uh, fall, and winter season, and with that we get changes in day length, the direction of sunlight, and the intensity of sunlight. Um, but other places they don't have a season uh, as much of seasonality as we do. Um, and that changes things like day length, direction of sunlight, and intensity of sunlight. Uh, and sometimes seasonality is maybe there's a wet season or a dry season. And so um, when we talk about sunlight, uh, all of these things that go that go together with sunlight, like the intensity of sunlight, if an organism needs direct sunlight, perhaps it's a plant that really needs direct sunlight, if it doesn't get that sun direct sunlight, it will not survive. Um, direction of the sunlight has a lot to do with seasonality, whereas uh, in the summer, the sun is more directly in the sky, and in the winter, it's very low in the sky, and that changes, that changes uh, weather, which is basically what's going on currently and if it's over a long period of time it changes the climate which is the a long period of time what the weather situation is like and so um, this is these are all non-living factors that definitely affect the living factors in an environment now the next thing I want to talk about is oxygen levels and we know that oxygen is produced by the green plants through this process of photosynthesis, right? Uh, a byproduct of photosynthesis, a waste product really, is oxygen. Um, and we know that in order to produce oxygen from photosynthesis, you need the energy of sunlight. Uh, without oxygen, cells would not be able to produce the ATP or the energy they need to carry out their processes. And so, really, um, we can see how, just how important sunlight is to something even like oxygen levels. If we were to take out the sunlight and we weren't uh, producing any oxygen, all organisms that rely on oxygen to make their energy would die. And so, really, you can start to see just how intertwined the abiotic factors are with the biotic. Now here's a, a graph, and this is sort of a theory on levels of tolerance, and you could stick any of those abiotic factors that we just talked about into this graph, and you'd get an, a very uh, similar result. So let's just talk about, let's just talk about one. Let's talk about pH. So if we have a, a organism that has some sort of optimal range, let's say it's seven, okay? Well, let's say it's seven, and down here is an acidic range, and up here is an, a basic range. We can see that there is something called an optimal range, where uh, at these pHs down here, maybe this is six, seven, maybe about an eight, uh, an organism lives very happily. It's in its optimal range. It can survive and reproduce at its best, highest rate. We also see uh, a tolerance range, and tolerance means, yes, it can tolerate it, but it's uh, it's featuring some sort of physiological stress. It's not doing well, and so we can see that it, the organisms are going to be infrequent. The survival and reproduction of these organisms is going to be less. And then we get to what is called a range of intolerance, where they're simply at a range where the organisms cannot survive, and so they will be absent. And you can put any sort of biotic factor you want in here. Temperature, you can put pH, you can put oxygen levels, you can put sunlight levels. And so it doesn't always, the optimal range could be anything. Perhaps if the optimal range was uh, very acidic, we would put the acidic uh, pHs here, and we would put the basic and the neutral pHs outside of this. So whatever the optimal range is for that species, that's where it does best at. So now we can talk about biotic factors, and they're a little bit more simple to think about. There's really three main categories, the producers, the consumers, and the decomposers. We know the producers, or the autotrophs, convert energy through the process of photosynthesis into the food, and they also produce the oxygen as a byproduct. We know consumers, uh, which are the heterotrophs, they depend on producers and occasionally other consumers for food. They need to capture and eat other uh, organisms to get their own energy. And the last are the decomposers or the detritivores. When we talked about fungi or bacteria, we said that they break down chemicals in dead bodies back into forms which can be reused by other organisms. Um, and so if any of these three levels break down, we would get breakdown, a massive breakdown of the whole system. And so we all, all of these biotic factors depend intimately on each other. So here's one example of biotic factors, two living things 
that are very, very intimately related. This is a lynx, and this is called a snowshoe hare. Um, the snowshoe hare is incredibly well adapted to its environment. It uh, has this really white colored coat you can see, and it lives in snow, snowshoe hare. And this is a lynx. Now this lynx is the only organism that can capture a snowshoe hare. And the lynx itself only eats snowshoe hare. And so we can take this data, which we did, we took this data from a trapping company that went back as far as 1845 to 1935. And we looked at the pelts that they captured of these this hare. And we were able to see that as this data went up and down, we also found that the lynx data went up and down and matched it very, very similarly. And what this shows is that as, oops, sorry, as populations of the hare increased, generally what we would see is populations of the lynx increasing. And so we get this very direct relationship where if there's more food for the lynx, they survive. When there's less food for the lynx, they also, they don't survive well. And so it's really this direct relationship of two biotic factors, two living organisms affecting each other. Now, it's not always that simple. In fact, it rarely ever is. And this is what we call a food web. And we look at food webs when we look at things like populations of a single individual, communities of multiple different uh, populations of a single species, I should say, and communities of many different species. And we look at entire ecosystems. Um, we see these lines are how energy is transferred from a primary producer to primary consumer to secondary consumer uh, and tertiary consumers. And so you can add a whole bunch of organisms to this list that's not on here. Um, but it, it, you can see that there, it's not a one-to-one one relationship anymore. So it's not always clear, well, what would happen if I take out this organism? What's going to happen to the rest of the organisms? And so it, it, it doesn't, it's not usually always that simple. But let's give you one story um, that we have where we took out one individual from a from an ecosystem and it affected every other individual in that ecosystem and that is the story of the gray wolf in Yellowstone National Park uh, it was actually hunted to extinction now local extinction it was around in other parts of the world still but hunted to extinction in Yellowstone National Park in the 1930s the reason it was done was actually by the government because they were sort of um, putting a, a big stress on the cattle uh, ranchers there that they were taking down the cattle and so the government assisted in hunting these guys down to an extinction um, but that caused some unintended uh, results and one of those was that elk populations started to soar now you might think well what's the big deal what's the problem it's just some elk well the problem is that even though bears would still feed on elk the predation overall went way down allowing for more and more elk to survive and reproduce. And when more and more elk survive and reproduce, the uh, population of the organisms they use for food are affected. And that's a big problem for aspen and willow trees. And really what happens is that the elk decimate young aspen and willow trees to the point where only the adult individuals were around and when they died, the, they were not being replaced. And we were seeing uh, almost no aspen and willow uh, in the park. And that's a problem for the beavers. Now beavers use uh, the aspen and willow trunks and trees and leaves to build their dams. And if you know anything about beaver dams, they uh, totally change what's downstream. And so if you had a river that's flowing this way and all of a sudden a dam is built, there's no more water flowing down this way. And that causes total different changes to the environment that actually is beneficial for a lot of organisms, that it's beneficial for organisms downstream and upstream. It might make uh, places for fish upstream and it might make places for other organisms downstream. And so when these guys aren't able to produce their dams, their population goes down and all populations that depend on their dams go down as well. So about 30 years later, uh, scientists come up with the idea, well, things are starting to go badly 
maybe we should reintroduce the gray wolf. And so an experiment is put in place where the gray wolves are brought, brought back to the park. And scientists were able to document what they call a trophic cascade that follows this. And the trophic cascade is just an event that happens when you introduce or take away an organism and as it affects every other organism in that ecosystem, in that web of, of, that, of interactions, what happens when one single organism is put back. And so what happens is, well, well, elf populations are still rising, and that might be a little counterintuitive. Uh, how is that good? Well, it, it's fine if the elk are um, they're acting differently because they know that they're getting taken down when they go into wide open spaces, so they stay away from these wide open spaces. And what happens is in those wide open spaces, they're not being, there's no foraging going on, and if it is, it's going on for a smaller amount of time, and that's good for aspen and willow. And what we see is the population of aspen and willow come back strong, and that's great for the beavers. They're able to build their dams, and it's great for all the other organisms that are affected by the beaver as well, like scavengers. Scavengers previously had to wait for cold weather to kill elk, like this a coyote and this red fox. Now they can feed on wolf killed elk, so their populations increase as well. Another thing that happens when you bring back aspen and willow trees is more songbirds come back. When you have songbirds, they're able to affect the seed distribution. When they eat seeds, they can take it somewhere else and they can affect the ecosystem as well. And so when you get uh when you get a single population like this gray wolf that taking it out makes this entire trophic cascade where everything sort of just goes wrong. We call these guys a keystone species. A keystone species is a single organism, organism that can have a massive effect on the ecosystem. And so these wolves really, really have a an, just huge impact. And what you can actually see and what they sort of say is that wolves can change the direction of rivers. And that's because the effect of taking them out takes these beavers out as well, which changes directions of rivers. And so it's not just the beavers, it's really the wolves that affect everything else. So lastly, I wanna give you a little bit of an example of what ecology can look like. When we assess living things, we can assess them at very many different levels. We could assess them at the individual level. Here's an individual zebra. We could assess it at the population level. Here's a population of zebra. We can assess it at a community level. Here's a community where you've got multiple populations, a population of zebra, a population of wildebeest, a population of giraffes, all living together. They're all being interacted with. They interact with each other. Um, you can assess it at an ecosystem level where we see this is a grassland ecosystem where these guys would live. You can assess it at a biome level where you have these long, large scale, uh, similar, similar ecosystems on a planet uh, or a world scale, we call those biomes, or we could look at the entire world, which we call the biosphere. And so we'll talk about all of these different cases as we go on and uh, as we progress. But this has just a, been a basic introduction to ecology and look forward to hearing from me on Wednesday for our next lecture.